First, I want to introduce our two board members. Mrs. Schwark is here. Um, she wants to wave, and Mr. Ruda is here as well. Um, actually, the camera's only on me, so thank you for the wave anyway. But <laughs> um, So we'll start with our, our slideshow that we've done throughout the past. Uh, this is our fifth town hall? Fifth? Fourth. Fourth town hall, trying to make sure everybody has as much information as they possibly want uh, as we work into the election week, which is actually one week from today. So we vote next Tuesday. We hope that you will exercise your democratic right to vote. And clearly, since we are here, uh, we hope that issue four is a yes for your family, and we hope that we can secure passage of issue four. Uh, a few things, uh, just kind of broad picture about our efforts to build new. Uh, we want our classroom spaces to better reflect what students will encounter in today's job market. That certainly is one of our big whys in terms of working toward this new high school. Uh, and the second, really, we, we want our students to have the best opportunities that are comparable to our neighboring districts. We don't want people, families, to feel like, well, if I want you know, the best high school opportunities, I've got to move out. Uh, we certainly have a very talented staff. We have great kids, great families. Our facilities are aged, they're dated, and the following slides will show you some tangible examples of, of how uh, we just don't have the same types of facilities that our surrounding neighbors do. A uh, number of, of features we'll work through in terms of trying to make sure that we are competitive and that we have the best facilities possible. Safety, and again, we'll go through these, but all of the sort of concepts are gonna go through now, these are all concepts that we would be able to dramatically improve uh, upon the introduction of a new high school. Safety, uh, physical comfort, future and career ready, collaborative spaces, technology, student engagement, and community engagement. So those are really the main themes that we will explore and expound upon uh, as we work through our slideshow here. First one is safety. Um, number of different safety features that I think we'd be pretty excited about that we simply can't recreate uh, without a substantial expense in the schools that we currently operate. Uh, so you see on the left-hand side, modern high schools, and I think the, the best feature or the best way to describe this is it's a dual lock vestibule with entry right into the main office immediately upon entry. So we don't have that in our current schools. Our schools weren't set up that way. We have worked to have the, the dual locking vestibules, uh, but they are not right on top of an office. We like if they're right on top of the office because it's, again, just more eyes and, and, and less space for people to travel uh, as they would walk from a check-in point to a main office. Think about Valley Forge, for instance. Now, first, it's not a dual locking vestibule. Next year, it will be, actually. Uh, again, we're working to do that in all of our schools. But again, the distance between the, the check-in point and when you get to the office, it's a, it's a decent walk. Uh, I don't want to say quarter of a mile, but I'll bet it's a tenth of a mile. So trying to cut down on, on sort of free travel is really important. We also have a tremendous amount of doors that Quite frankly, we just can't, can't secure all of those doors um, to the extent we, we would like to. When you have 180 doors, like our, our high schools currently do have on their first floors, and you have, you know, next year we'll have 1,500 students in each of our high schools, things are gonna happen. Kids are gonna open a door. Kids are gonna walk out a door. It's, it's very difficult to secure all of those. So new schools are meant to minimize the number of entrances that you have, as well as making sure that we maximize the security uh, incumbent upon those doors. Another example is just physically comfortable. Um, certainly we've, we've done some things with our furniture and our learning spaces uh, that, that have upgraded them and have modernized them, but we're, we're also limited in you know, the windows that we have and the HVAC systems that we have. So these are just some examples. And again, when we show these, it's not that we're trying to recreate exactly that room. It's that we're trying to show you the difference. It's, we're trying to show you the concept of, of what can look different in a new school. When we look back at, at the last uh, bond issue uh, in the fall, I think we did a great job of showing folks what the outside would look like. Uh, that, that rendering that we posted, I think on a Friday night, had about 35,000 views by Monday morning, uh, which was phenomenal for us. So I think people understood that we're trying to you know, keep some of the past and have the, the clock tower preserved and have uh, the red brick exterior of the Parma Senior High is really, really makes it a visually attractive building. What we didn't do was talk about some of the things inside. So again, this is just an example. Uh, this is a media center, a modern media center. A lot more natural light, that's really a key piece of it. 
Uh, you see a, a little bit more of a physically comfortable seating arrangement as well, and then that compares to the media centers that we have now. Future career ready, certainly we want our students to have the access to, to the best possible career technical programs. We have 17 programs, and we've done a great job to make sure that those are connected to industries. Uh, we have great partners uh, that help us to make sure that we have good learning standards in place and you know, the right teaching approaches to make sure our kids can come out. And when they come out, they're getting industrial certifications, which is really exciting for us and college credit hours. So career tech is, is really a great way to go. It used to be called vocational education. It's really evolved. It's no longer for the kids not going to college. It's really for anyone. It's for students that do see themselves more on that trades path, but it's also for students who are trying to get themselves you know, some, some certifications so that they have you know, a very good part-time job coming out if they're gonna work their way through college. Um, or they're having college semester hours if they want to simply matriculate into a four-year institution. So we certainly want to make sure that we have the best equipment and this would be something that would upgrade our equipment from a career tech standpoint. When we think about our buildings, we can retrofit many different technologies. But the difficulty is we're retrofitting. And retrofitting is always going to have either a higher cost or some type of infrastructure limit to what we can do. A new high school does not have those limits. Collaborative spaces as well, this is something that's evolved as schools have been built. Uh, we would work with our teachers. We, we've said this all along. Uh, we do not want to make these into facilities that would be so uh, uh, modern and, and, and so sort of new age that they're you know, sort of not user friendly on day one. We want facilities that would be user friendly on day one, but also have some opportunity uh, for some evolution in the way we teach um, and, and really embracing in terms of, we've talked a lot about our three key words in Parma, read, write, discuss, and sometimes that discussion should take on a little bit more than just a classroom environment. And so if you look at the picture on the left, you see classrooms that expand into some collaborative learning spaces. It's a flexible classroom. Certainly, we don't have that ability uh, within our classrooms at Parma Senior High, at Normandy, at Valley Forge uh, that we would with a new high school. Technology, again, I think sort of my favorite story, and folks who have seen this have heard this, this before, but uh, we're, we're, we're again limited. Um, if you walk through Parma Senior High right now, and we posted today, we've got some open houses coming up for folks that want to walk the building one more time before we would you know, close it uh, and take it down later this summer. Uh, but you'll see actually uh, ethernet cables that we actually run, you can see them. You're not supposed to be see ethernet cables just running down the hallway. And we run them down the hallway, we actually run them underneath the gate. The gate is actually used to, to close off a wing. We can't close that gate anymore because that's where the ethernet cables go. It's that type of, of aged technology that we're, uh, we're battling. Um, and certainly modern high schools, again, we can do the best we can to import all of these new systems into something that exists. But when you import systems to, into something that already exists, your problems are A, cost, and B, you're just limited. The infrastructure is what it is, and it's very difficult and expensive to change. Student engagement, uh, certainly again, we want to create um, uh, places where our students are, are engaged in project-based learning, as an example. Um, and again, our classrooms now, we're, Normandy's our oldest building, or newest building, I should say, opened in 1968. Education was what it was in 1968. Buildings was what they were what they were in 1968. If you think about how much society has evolved, how many different teaching techniques, how much different technology we embrace, and, and really how much we em, em, embrace students collaborating and working together. And that's an important part of what we're trying to get our students to exit with, 21st century skills, where they have the ability to really engage with their partners and with their peers. That's not how our buildings were set up. Folks have come up to me and said, well, you know, I went to school. I went to Parma Senior High, and I went there and graduated in 1960, and we had 3,000 kids and two shifts and a couple different dramatic changes. A, students had no idea of what was called an Ohio standardized test at that time. And if you want a, just a, a brief glimpse of how rigorous our standards are now and how difficult our curricula is, are, 
Google Ohio Department of Education and look up some of those standards and see the rigorous standards that, that we prepare students for. And we're proud of that. We, we, we we're proud that education has evolved. But that wasn't, uh, the rigor that our students are, are working through now is not something we were preparing for uh, in the 1960s, 1970s, even 1980s. Standardized testing did not begin really until the 90s. And it's only gotten more difficult with each iteration uh, of testing. And the second piece, is that we didn't have any special education classrooms. Maybe one, maybe two. If you walk up Harbor Senior High or Normandy or Valley Forge now, you're gonna see eight, nine, 10, 11 classrooms. And so we have evolved, education has evolved in how we deliver um, instruction, and we wanna make sure that our building can too. Community engagement's a really important piece. We have said since, since really I've been here, we've tried to make strong commitments to sharing our facilities with you. We've said that our facilities are your assets. And so we've had open walking, we've had open swimming, we share Byers Field in terms of uh, movie nights that we have. Uh, we've also done egg hunts. So we, we really are committed to saying, even if you don't have a child, even if you don't have you know, some type of direct tie to our school district now, you have an asset that we want you to use. You pay property taxes for that. We want you to feel a connection to our school district, and one of the ways we can do that uh, is through the facilities. Now, again, I, I, I'm very transparent. I want to share with you when I hear concerns. We had a concern the other day from a resident who actually explained that he voted for the bond issue. But then he got a mailing that showed how, you know, we're gonna have a pool and a fine arts center. And he actually said, I'm never gonna vote for a, a bond issue or a levy again, because that's wasteful. Our commitment to the community is that we don't want to replace a facility like Palmer Senior High or eventually Normandy or Valley Forge with an inferior or, you know, a facility that would have less amenities. And so, yes, it's important to be able to have a pool because that's what we have now and we have swim teams and again, we want to share that with the community. Uh, and we've, we've made a commitment to doing that. The Fine Arts Center is another piece. We want community theater groups using that uh, and, and really seeing that as an asset. Uh, Fine Arts Center will have uh, uh, better acoustics. It'll have a more intimate seating arrangement. Uh, and we just sent that mailing as, as well. So, just another example of how we want to structure our schools and why building new is advantageous. Uh, last piece, and then we'll take any questions that we have. This gives you sort of an overhead, and we want to show you this because what we have up above are four wings that sort of jut out of the main complex there. That's actually toward Longwood at the top. Um, 54th runs to our left here, and we've got the park behind or toward the bottom. Each of those wings is gonna have a different grade level, and we do that so that there's not at any one time some type of overwhelming feeling of you know, a freshman walking into the cafeteria and experiencing a thousand kids in the lunch period. We don't want that. Um, we will have a ninth grade community, a 10th grade community, then we've got a STEM wing, and STEM will have 11th and 12th grade in it, and we'll also have a career tech learning uh, community. The ninth and 10th grades will have their own cafeterias, and then we'll have another one separate for 11th and 12th grades. They'll have the guidance counselors right there um, in, that, in that area. Their classrooms will be centralized there. Um, we'll have home liaisons, we'll have the grade level principal. We're really trying to make sure that when people hear 3,000, and that's really about the projected enrollment of the school, that they don't think, oh my gosh, it's, you know, my, my kid's one of 3,000. That's, that's not how we're viewing this. We're breaking down that building, and you can see it very tangibly uh, in terms of how we want to, to structure things to make it more personal, to make it so that students have the support that they might need. So with that, we'll take any questions. We've only got a couple here, people here in the audience. We also had Mark from GPD joined us again. Uh, so if you had a question for the architect, we're happy to answer it. And Gary, we'll, we'll turn to you too to see if there's any questions. No one is watching the 445 version of the town hall. We thought, let's give it one more try. L let me tell you this too, folks. It is difficult to get these libraries. We wanted to do a libraries. Typically, libraries have been a little bit more user friendly to get into, so they had been popular. Um, so I, I would have done other times, but 4:30 this week worked in terms of the libraries. Yes, sir. Gary got one. A recent article has been circulating stating that a district is within their legal right to change the terms of the bond at any time without needing another vote from the residents. 
Most recently, this happened in the Cleveland School District in 2001, where taxpayers are now paying 6.1 mills on bonds that appeared on the ballot as averaging 3.7 mills. Are the tax rates shown on the ballot for bond issues binding? To, to my knowledge, yes. I don't know if Mark, Mark is, has more experience in that. You can't change it. Yeah, so once it's written, once the ballot issue of money is written, that's what it is. Yeah, so, so Mark from GPD is saying, and my experience with this is no. Um, I can't speak intelligently about what happened in Cleveland. I, I can't imagine a situation in which that would ever happen. Um, I will tell you that millage sometimes exists um, based on property values, but that's not... Um, Typically, it'll go the other way. So your property values start to increase. Millage will actually reduce so that we would never collect more uh, than that whatever dollar figure it would be, $11.67. But again, it's based on your property value. So we would never collect more than that for the duration of the bond. Yes? I have some questions. And it's easy for me to stand. I'm sorry. Have at it. I, uh, so you said no one's watching online? Well, I, I just said we didn't have too many questions. We have some people online yeah, watching. Yeah, some people watching. Yeah. Okay, um, my first thing I want to say is I commend you for trying to um, open up the facilities and open up the buildings to the community. Um, and I, I've been in the district for 37 years, and so I really think that's something positive that Thank you're you. trying to do. As far as the, uh, the new building, if the new building is built, and it's an opening to the community um, to uh, to use uh, rooms. You know how how would that look like? Uh, would be or, or you don't even know yet. Like, how well, I, I can speak to it. Yeah. So we have we have a, a permits uh, clerk or secretary, whatever the specific job title is. So you apply for that, um, and then quite frankly, if you're a community group, there might be some minimal charge, but we try to minimize that. Um, and, and if you're some community groups that are you know affiliated with the school district, like a PTA, or you know, we really waive that typically. Uh, not everywhere, not for every PTA, and I want to, but but the PTAs that are open when the building's open anyway. There are some buildings where we have multiple shifts. The high schools are multiple shift buildings uh, because you always have some type of sporting event going on, and so there wouldn't be any additional charge for that. So it, yeah, short answer goes through permits um, and uh, you know we how determine how we would bill somebody. If it's, if it's an organization that meets every month or every week, do you, do you see that being feasible that they would be able to get a space that they would I do. Use? Yeah, I, I do. So I, I do think, she asked, would it be feasible for somebody that meets once a week or every, that's exactly what we want. We want that synergy. We want that partnership with the community. And so we would work to make sure that if there were a cost, it was only because there was some cost to us, um, you know, a custodian staying over or something like that. But again, in a high school, there's multiple shifts. So those rooms are typically open. Okay. And my next question is, uh, oh, unless you're ready, you go ahead. You, go you ahead. sure? If you have another one on. Gary, have one online. Property values that are at all time high right now. The bond issue requires the district to collect a certain amount of money per year. When, sorry, let me slow down a little bit. When home values decrease, does that mean the taxes collected for the bond will increase to meet the terms of the bond? So that $11.67 per $100,000 freezes forever. That dollar figure, we, we cannot fluctuate. So if your property values go up, you stay at that $11.67. If your property values go down, it stays at $11.67 per month. And that may be where Cleveland had some, some millage alterations. And again, I can't speak intelligently into to, to what happened in Cleveland. But that, that $11.67 per month per $100,000 is frozen for the duration of the bond, whether property values go up or down. That's the effect of House Bill 90. That's why when we have an emergency levy, um, and I'll give you an example. So say something passed in 1984, an emergency levy, and it collected $5 million in 1984. For the life of that emergency levy, and that's 10 years, and then you have to come back and you get a renewal, it's only ever gonna collect $5 million. Doesn't matter if the valuation of Parma quadruples overnight. That levy is only ever worth $5 million. So that's the House bill uh, impact, and again, that leads Yes, your millage to fluctuate sometimes to go up or down to make sure that the dollar amount doesn't change. The dollar amount will not change. Millage is a little bit flexible, but it's so that we'll never collect more or less than that dollar amount. Is that? Yeah, it can't change. Yes. Is there another one, Gary? Not at this time. 
Yes, ma'am. Okay, so hi, Mark. How are you? Good. Um, I just was wondering if you could speak to um, the Mark some more about safety of the building. I know that back when um, I toured some of the new buildings, uh, a few of them, um, and I know you mentioned like the, the doors and the exits, like um, how in an emergency uh, evacuation, uh, yes. if you can explain to, speak to that a little bit more. Sure, Juan, if you look at that floor plan there, it's, a, it's an aerial of the plan of okay. what it would be. Okay. And Dr. Smilex noted that there will be um, four wings there. Right, right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if in an emergency, those wings would lock off. And there would be an alternate way for all of the students to get out without going back into any central area. But we would lock off different portions of that building based on where the intruder is. Mm -hmm. And there would be a button at the front desk. We would have numerous cameras throughout the building, so we, we would know where an intruder is. There would be many features that we would do at the front entrance for letting visitors in mm -hmm. that you currently do not have. Okay. There will be many features that right now we don't have that we would implement in the new building to make it a lot safer. I wasn't necessarily talking about intruder, but um, I was talking more of evacuation if the, in a fire in a situation where they need to evacuate. The, um, do, you, do you have, you might be able to do that, do they, do they still have emergency like fire drills? And we do, once a month actually we have fire drills, and then four times a year we have the intruder drill. Enough access to, to, to have, would you say 3,000 students would be there, enough doors and exits to, yes. to accommodate that? Yes, but one, the one thing that I would say is, compared to what you have now, you have so many doors that it's hard to even track where something would happen. Mm -hmm. So we would give you areas where you can sit and wait for rescue, but we would also give you many areas where you can get out of the building in an emergency. Okay. And we work with, and that was an important yeah. point we wanted to make too. So I, I think one of our strengths is actually that we work really well with our police and fire departments. Um, our, our leader of safety and security has great relationships with all three mm -hmm. departments, particularly the police. Uh, we talk to them more often. Uh, but certainly the fire as well. And so that'll be an important part of this construction and planning process. I mean, we will sit down hand in hand, arm in arm with these guys and make sure that they agree and you know this is something they would sign off on, so to speak. Um, the one piece I want to say too is shatterproof glass right. is something that schools use yes. now too. Um, and, and we have that in some places, but this would allow us to expand that obviously. Right, right. Yeah, what, we, what I've mentioned at previous meetings is this is a concept plan but early on in the design, the police and fire would be sitting in all the meetings with us. Right. So they'd be talking to us about what they need in terms of safety and what would make it easier for them. I really, back when we, this whole thing started, wished that it was a requirement for each citizen in the district to see the buildings and just, just, the, just the technology and the capability to design something so incredible and so you know, so much more safe for our for our students. I mean, I I just I try to explain this to people, but you can't explain yeah. it. You really have to go see it's it. To live it, yeah. Yeah, you really have to go see it. You've always been one of our biggest supporters, so thank you. <laughs> so my next question is actually, unless he has another one for uh, my neighbor, because I think you know she she spoke with me about it, and I think really people, you know, don't understand this this part of it, and just clarifying it. And I'm sure you've you've spoken to it, but it's been so many years that you've been working on building. <laughs> it's kind of just to refresh my memory. So I understand completely about the state, um, the 71 million or whatever that they're going to contribute. Um, and I, I understand is, is she's she asking me? Mark, Mark, can you come, come up here? Maybe? No, 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 they're having trouble hearing both. Oh, oh, me? Yeah, yeah if you can just right stand close to the microphone. Right. Do they want to hear what I have? Yes, yeah. of course. Mark, you, you want to sit in the front row here? Um, so I would say, like, my neighbor was talking to me about the, the, the money that we get from the state, the money that, and everyone seems to be, there's confusion. I know people have asked many times, and you say that there's not, like, a way to know when that money would come in Correct, yeah. and about being in line and, and, and how many schools, school districts would be looking for, you know, money to help build. And so the money that you're asking for is for the entire project. 
I mean, the bond issue is for the entire. So the bond issue is for the high school specifically. Right, but it's for the entire high school. To That's be correct. Built. That's correct. Um, there would be no more, no further high school issue. This would be the bond issue that would fund the entire. You would be school. able to complete the project. Correct. That's correct. Right. right. So yes. that was a concern, and not having the seventy-one million, and whenever that money would be come in, um, what would the situation be then? Like. So there's a number of different options, and honestly, this would be a, another board process here. One of the options is to take the $71.9 million when we would get it, and again, that could be two years, that could be four years, that could be six years. The OCC won't tell us exactly when that would be, not because they're playing games with us, but specifically because they don't know how many people who are in line with us actually want that money at any given time. They fund approximately 10 to 20 school districts per year based on how much you know, those school districts are asking. That sounds like a really long time, if it's 10 or 20, to get to about number 306 where we sit. However, there could be 200 school districts that never ask for money because they're either built uh, or they don't want to rebuild or they can't pass a bond issue. When that $71.9 million would come, the board would have options. One option is to apply it to future construction. And what we've said in our district is that we want to be 4 to one Four elementaries, two middle schools, one high. So that 71.9 could be applied to the cost of the elementary and the middle. They could also put it in permanent improvement money and just say, okay, every year we get 5.1-ish million dollars in permanent improvement money. You could add that 71 and potentially you pull off a permanent improvement levy for a while. That's, that's an option that the board could pursue. They could also apply it immediately to the bond and potentially shorten that life of the bond or reduce what we're actually paying with that 71.9. So there's a number of different options. Um, Again, it, it's hard to predict, A, when we're going to get it, B, what construction costs look like at that time. Uh, our latest mailing says that if you look back over the last 20 years, the average increase in construction costs is, is I think, 4.67%. So, you know, if you, if you keep going up and up, obviously, you know, it gets more expensive. That might make millage go higher. So a lot of different variables, a lot of different wild cards, but three different options the board can do. A, use it to apply to the future construction, B, pay off the bond faster, or C, lower property taxes through putting that into some type of account for permanent improvement and pulling off a permanent improvement levy. So any of those could be options. And again, yeah, the those- The reason why I spoke to that is the people, like I said, my neighbor and the people I speak to in general are concerned, like, I'm not sure if they don't believe that money would come in, and I'm not sure if you can explain the difference, it's my understanding, like that money is for new buildings, like I, I told them I compare it to a car, like if it costs more to fix your car than, than, than it's worth, it's, then you get a different car. Um, so it's a great example. I, yeah. I'm not sure if people understand like, you know, the maintenance and fix buildings and repair buildings, like they're willing to give us $71 million to help us build new, but they're not willing to give us $71 million to help us fix every the, the buildings that we have. I, I You're exactly that's, right. That's I exactly think that's right. keeping people, I mean, when she asked me that question, and many people do, that they just, they don't want to vote for it. They think there's just like, oh, why can't they help us fix it? And it's my understanding that the state will not contribute and help, continue to help us repair. That's correct. So, so the, state, the state has a threshold. They came out in 2018. 2017, and they looked at all of our schools, and they say, okay, we're gonna do this, and we, we've published this online, actually. This is still on our website. You can go ahead and see how they came up with the calculations for every one of our 15 schools in terms of what it would cost to renovate versus rebuild. And if the cost to renovate exceeds 66% of the cost to rebuild, then you get nothing for renovation. But you do get, for right now, it's 37% of the, the share of, of matching funds, essentially, or 37% of the you know, whole price, you get 37% of the cost of new construction. So she's absolutely correct. The state had all of our buildings at 66% or higher. And full transparency, at first, Normandy was not on that list. Normandy sat right at 65%. We said, hey, we think, why don't you come out and look at some of the work we've had to do in Normandy. We think it should eclipse that 66%. They did come back out, I think in 2018 or 19, said, you're right, Normandy's now at 66 or 67%. So every one of our schools, and some of them honestly are up in the 
80s and 90s. There's one, Pleasant View, believe it or not, uh, the, the first step is above 100%, meaning it would cost more to renovate that building uh, than it would to just rebuild it, which is pretty interesting. Most of them sit you know, right around the 75, 80% mark. And again, that was 2017 they did that study. So if you think about Valley Forge in Normandy, they came out with a $103 price tag to renovate. And we're not talking about massive upgrades like we showed you. We're talking about fundamentals, roofs, HVAC systems, some technology upgrades. Not any type of new wing, not types of new learning spaces, not a new pool, specific for the most part to your nuts and bolts, your, your, your you know, fundamentals to, to keep a, a school functioning. And that was $103 million in 2017 dollars. So and, and that's Dr. great, that's a very good point. And Dr. Smiley, people should understand that I've worked with districts over the last few years and they're in the program getting nine to 20%, 21%. Parm are getting 37%. You will get your money from the state before they will get theirs. Huh. You heard it from the architect. This man works throughout the state, so. And, and actually, the reason that is is 37% tells us we're higher on the list. So the, the higher number your matching funds are, the closer you are to the front of the line. So you know what, what he's worked with are districts that are behind us in line. So yeah, I mean that that yeah that intuitively makes sense. Can you just clarify too, like that's so that's tax money, obviously that all of us have already paid, right? So that's essentially our money that we could bring back home. Yeah, I, I love that point too, and you know I. I Glad you made it, because uh, I hadn't made it yet, but yeah, I mean, Columbus money, folks, that's not like, that's, that's public property taxes. That, the, the, those are state taxes that you've already paid, and they sit in a pot and get dispersed throughout the state, and we haven't claimed our share of the money at all. It's, it's gone elsewhere. You can you know, look at surrounding communities and see where you've done OCC projects. In fact, there's an OCC map, and we used to use this in our slideshows, there are more districts now who have tapped into OFCC funds that haven't. We're now in the minority of school districts who have not claimed any money from, from OFCC. So yes, that is, that's, those are public funds that we hope that we'll be able to, to claim at this point. Now that you brought it up again, I mentioned it before a few years ago, um, that was really just impressive, made an impression on me. The, the visual picture of the map with the blue dots at that point, showing you um, how far behind we are as far as like, you know, doing, doing this for our children and for their future, for their education. And now that I mentioned education, I just wanna speak to the fact, on a side note, um, education is a right, not privilege. I mean, every, every person in this country, every person in the state, in this district, every child in this district has the right to an, a safe, good education at a level, you know, in our day and time that's appropriate. Um, and it's just a tragedy, you know, that, that uh, citizens don't want to give them that. You know, and so, but I did want to mention that again. I know I mentioned it a couple of years ago. Um, I don't want to use the word push. I can't think of the right words. That's why I wasn't sure if I wanted to hear people to hear me online. <laughs> um, the map with the blue dots, if we just like send that out to people to just, because that was just such a visual for, for me personally to see, oh, see, so we can say, oh, Parma's not doing it, and everyone else is giving their kids the, the best of the best. Everyone else, every, every other district is, is, is really has a passion for their children's education, for our future. You know, we're not going to be here, and our houses aren't going to be here. I'm not the Guru Reaper, but the reality is, you know, it's about them and um, the knowledge that we can give them, and that we're capable of giving this to them, you know, on the here and now. And, you know, we need to do that. And um, just to see that clearly. Um, how many districts surrounding us have, have built a building or, you know, built at least one building or, or done something um, towards that goal. And um, so that's what I thought was so important. Maybe you didn't think that that was a good picture. Maybe you have a different opinion than I do, Mr. Smiley. No, I, I thought it was a great <laughs> picture. I just, you know, so that's it right there. And so everything that's blue 
That's a new school. Right. I mean, um, they're impressed on me. Could say to you without using words, yes, let's do this. Let's yeah, give our children these opportunities. Let's, you know, let's put this on Facebook. Let's put this online. Let's put send this out in the mailings and see, you know, this is what we want to do for our children. We have a passion. We have love for our children and their education. And we support this 100%. And so that's, I wanted to mention that since you brought up the, the map. No, that's, yeah, and thank you for that. Because this is exactly, this is the map you were talking about. And we did right. use this. Um, no, I think it's a great visual. I think over time you tweak things. and you know. right. There's another question on Facebook? There are a couple. Um, one's a comment, but you can maybe speak to it. Um, a concern that, you know, that we're in this situation because it should have been maintained throughout the decades prior to. Yeah, and, and I mean, I, I think I would say to that, you know, if you would walk our buildings, and I invite you to walk our buildings, and we, you know, we have tours coming up. Uh, we had a tour last week. Um, we've absolutely kept our buildings warm, safe, and dry for students. I mean, that, that's not the concern. The concern is, as I said before, you, you get to a point, and I think the car analogy was great, you know, if you bought your car in 1968, you can put new tires on it, and you can put, you know, new oil in it, but ultimately, you know, that car is going to wear down, and, and there's just a lot of things in that car that have evolved in car technology you're never going to be able to do with that car from 1968. And I think the buildings are a great example. I mean, think about new technology. Think about some of the new security systems we've talked about. Uh, think about the collaborative learning spaces. Ultimately, we have maintained the buildings. They are warm, safe, and dry, but they have minimal assets beyond that. And that's really what we're trying to help people understand. We do get permanent improvement money. We get, as I said before, approximately $5.1 million per year is accessible for different projects. But folks, when you're spending those things on roofs and driveways, which are our two typically you know, things that we sort of rotate through the summer, we're gonna spend $300,000 on a roof uh, for Greenbrier this year. You have to do it. I mean, there is no option, right? I mean, you have to have a, a, a dry place. But you know that, that chips away at that 5.1 million. It, you, we, we don't have the money to actually modernize these buildings, to make them 21st century learning environments. We don't have that. And so that's, that's the ask, and that's the reason that we're coming. We can do warm, safe, and dry, although it's getting more and more expensive, but the building is the building, and you can only upgrade it so much. Um, another question is, if the bond issue fails, will it be on the ballot again in November? It will not, actually. Um, so the bond issue cannot go back in, on in November, and here's why. Uh, we had this, this uh, program or, or offer uh, accepted by the OFCC last fall in time to get it on to the ballot for last November. It lasts one year, and after one year it expires. So we can reapply, but when we reapply, they're going to go through everything again because all of the numbers, the enrollment studies, the demographic studies they've done, those all expire as well. The OCC does a very comprehensive enrollment study because they want to make sure they're not going to build buildings that are too big or too small. That's you know the worst nightmare is that you go through this as a community and have far too much room or not enough room. So we will need to renew all those efforts and that would not be complete in time to get on the ballot in November. So this is it. We have this shot and we are hopeful for passage, but after this we'd have to go back to the state if we decided to do that. In all honesty, I think the sentiment, and I, you know, we can't make promises, but I'm telling you my honest opinion on uh, April 25th, 2023, is that we would live with the two for quite some time. Um, there will be other issues that we'll have to work through. Um, another, oh. Mark? And, and your percentage at 37% is likely to change. Yes, so once we would go through the, the process again, the enrollment study, again, everything's tied to that enrollment study because enrollment, you, you get so many square feet per student and then there's a cost per square foot to, to build your facility. So until you do another enrollment study, you really don't know. And at that point, you know, the 37%, and we've said this before, it could go up, it could go down. There is no guarantee that we would ever see 37% again. Next question is, it may be too soon to ask for this, but thinking far off into the future when this 4 to one concept is a reality, what are the plans for the unused school buildings and properties? So the, the 4 to one plan, um, the, the two middle schools would be Normandy and Valley Forge. The four middle uh, elementary schools would be Pleasant Valley plus our three middle schools. So you'd have Pleasant Valley, Greenbrier on the west side, and the east side you'd have Shiloh and Hillside. 
And so those would be your, your, your elementary points. At that point, your smaller territories become you know, different projects. For instance, and again, we, my, my best answer for that is that we work with the city to, to really sort of create a partnership in, in how that land should proceed. Um, if you think about State Road, you know, that's in a, a retail district. And that took some time because originally that city councilman was anti changing that zoning. That zoning had to be changed from educational purposes on State Road at State Road Elementary to retail purposes. And so now you see a drug mart. Well, I can promise you that the council person where Renwood is would never sign off on an alteration like that. So Renwood is going to be some type of, of, of housing or it could be recreation. Those are conversations we'll have with the city. I can tell you one piece right now is that we're working with a resident to let him extend his yard on a minimal basis uh, through a fair purchase agreement so that he can have a, a second garage, I believe is his purpose there. So that was backed by the city council people. We always work with the city to create some type of, of you know, partnership and, and synergy for what they think uh, is, is, is right for that space and what we think is fair as it is our property um, and a, our property that we would sell. We've also just, you know, as a general uh, point, of, point of conversation, we've talked with the Metro Parks as well. The Metro Parks are a phenomenal um, landlord, so to speak, of land uh, throughout Northeast Ohio. And if there's no other use, potentially it's a Metro Park that we can come to agreement with. Again, none of those things are decided, but those are all different options. I just want to key in on you know, that partnership with the city when we go through processes like that. Another question, what if the bond is supported but not the actual plan proposed? This, this bond is the plan. So if you don't support the one high school concept, we appreciate your yes vote, but that's essentially what you're voting to support. There, there isn't a backup plan, there isn't you know, some type of referendum that we would then come forward. This is, they're tied together. So the 250 million and the $71.9 million, those are tied together for specifically that high school. So there, there is no other plan, there wouldn't be a change to the plan. We would lose the OCC funding if, if we made some type of change. We'd also lose an awful lot of credibility because we've been everywhere trying to say that this is the actual plan. Has the district re-evaluated the option of consolidating high schools to Parma Senior High only if the bond fails or is demolition an absolute? Demolition is an absolute. We've actually signed uh, the agreement with, and I, I keep forgetting the name of the, the construction company that we're going to use. Um, but we, we've signed that agreement. They are progressing forward with it. Parma High was not large enough to be one high school, not without a significant investment that we, quite frankly, don't have the money to make. So you would have had to convert, again, the central office uh, into classrooms. And even at that point, it was only going to be large enough for 10th or 12th grade. Please remember uh, the additional career tech space we have beyond, you know, people say, well, I went to school when there were 3,000 students there. And career tech really wasn't at the level that it is now. As well, uh, remember the special education impact. And with approximately 16% of our students with disabilities, those, it's a significant number of classrooms throughout the facility. So Parma High was not large enough. We did look at that. That was an option that we vetted with our board. Uh, but Parma High was not large enough without significant investments on its own. Uh, one comment that um, but maybe if you could clarify, it says it was stated that percentage would increase to 39% in the board meeting at 11-17 of 2022. If you could just clarify why that is. That, that is correct. So if we had had the option to go back this year, which we did not have because we were locked in for a year, that 37% would have tweaked up to 39. That, that is accurate, and that's what I've stated before. However, we were locked in at 37. And again, that 39 was only for this fiscal year. So when our plan expires, we, we don't know. It, it could be 39, it could be 41, it could be 32. That, that, that's an honest assessment of where we're at. That's how the OFCC works. There's 606 school districts, and they put all of this different data into some very complex formula, which by the way, they don't release. They've told us there's two key variables, enrollment and property values, the property valuation of the entire district. That's what they've explained to us. So both of our variables are going in the wrong direction. Enrollment is decreasing and property values have increased. 
they prioritize districts who are going in the other way, where you have enrollment increasing but property values decreasing. I'm not sure exactly where that might be throughout the state. I, I, I don't know every community that way, but I can tell you our variables are moving in the wrong direction. That's 100% true. That's something you can ask OFCC for. Uh, but yes, his, his, his or her comment is correct. If we had been eligible this year, we would have had the 39, but we were never eligible because we were locked in. Yeah, Dr. Smiley, one thing to point out to everybody too is the state's new cost set came out two weeks ago, and their cost set, depending on what region in the state you are in, went up three to four percent. Okay, good. So. It's always a good time for you to insert how you build buildings under budget, too. Right. <laughs> this building will be on budget. Guaranteed. GPD is um, well-versed and, and, and well-respected, well well-experienced in OCC projects. So we vetted, actually this goes back to now, the summer of 2018. We vetted, we asked for a request for proposals from a, a wide number, well, anybody wanted to send it. We had probably seven to eight different um, uh, proposals. We, we wielded that down to three. We had three finalists come in and interview. GPD was our selection, uh, and they've been with us since. The first time I met Mark was the summer of 2018. Mark has been at all of these buildings, uh, uh, building our future meetings, I should say, and different meetings that we've had throughout the process. And again, th their experience with the OCC was their separating factor. And so they're, they're a great partner to have in this endeavor. Ladies in the audience, you could probably, do you want to come up here and just finish it for me? I mean, you probably could. <laughs> You've heard this enough. All right, well, folks, we've got one week left. We have the email address. If you have questions, email me directly or email, if it's easy to remember, bond issue questions at parmacityschools.org. We want to make sure that we are as transparent as possible. We appreciate your time, and we are hopeful for passage on the 2nd.